Hi there, my name is Dr. Travis Holland. I'm a senior lecturer in communication at Charles Sturt University, Australia. This podcast is an exploration into our digital society. It forms the lectures for my class, envisioning the digital society, but also aims to engage you, the listener out there beyond my classroom. If you like what you hear, please send a voice note through Spotify or get in contact via the details in the show notes. This episode, we turn to the art of podcasting itself. Throughout the series so far, I've tried to craft lectures that sound like podcasts instead of lectures that are podcasted. And I know from the listener stats that there is an audience out there beyond the students, so I think it's working. Here, we'll discuss some of the ways I've tried to do that, what you can do for your own podcasts and other storytelling projects. Welcome to Digital Society. To start with, I'm going to take a step back and think about what is a podcast. It might seem obvious, and the fact that you're listening to a podcast right now might make it seem like a redundant question, but perhaps it's not as obvious as all that. As described influentially by Richard Berry, podcasting has its origins at the intersection of radio and participatory media, a topic which I discussed in detail in a previous episode. It is a medium through which individuals, groups and organisations can create and distribute audio storytelling on the internet. It originated as a distinct form of media alongside a wider diversification and development of internet media to incorporate richer forms of content beyond text around the early 2000s, and specifically encompasses, quote, audio content downloaded from the internet either manually from a website or automatically via software applications. That was Richard Berry from 2006. Elaine Urit describes podcasting as a network that is deeply interconnected with a variety of mediating networks, including radio, television, social networking systems, and even intimacy. More recently, we've seen the emergence of video podcasts. I actually had a brief Twitter discussion with Richard Berry recently about the validity of the term podcast as applied to video in light of YouTube's move into the medium and I will link that discussion for your edification in the show notes. Having delivered my series of lectures as a podcast, I'm now asking my students to do likewise, and create their own podcast segments looking at these same topics again. In coming weeks, I hope to fill this feed with their voices rather than mine. So, here, for both you and my students, is my approach to podcasting. I have in my office some fairly helpful equipment, a good quality microphone or two, and a Rodecaster, which is a podcast-optimised mixing desk by the audio company Rode. I use their mics as well, for the most part. But the key thing here is not that you need to spend hundreds of dollars on a microphone, but that you should have one, one that's separate from your computer or your mobile phone, if at all possible. And if you don't have a particularly good one, then proximity really matters. And I'll get back to that later in the episode, in a conversation with a special guest. If recording an interview over the internet, as we often do nowadays, it is best to use a local file recording rather than an audio-visual platform like Zoom. That means either asking your guests to record locally on their computer or device, or using a platform like Riverside, which does that, and I will link to Riverside as well. As for composing the podcast, it can be quite useful to have complex audio editor like Adobe Audition, but again, it's not necessarily required. For the most part, I actually just import my files into Spotify's podcasting tool, which used to be called Anchor, but in the last few weeks rebranded and is now just Spotify for podcasters. From there, you can make simple edits, insert additional sounds and sound effects, and underlay voice tracks with music. The website freesound.org is highly recommended to get any additional sound effects. I partially script my podcasts, which means that I tend to have an idea of what I'm going to say, sometimes fully scripted like for an introduction, but I allow myself to flow a little bit if I need to add bits of information. Likewise, with interviews, preparation helps. If you've done some reading 
and thinking before jumping on the call, you'll be able to go off script and have a conversation that follows. Talk to your guest a while before hitting record to make sure everyone is comfortable and check sound levels as you do so. Importantly, I like to explicitly ask that they're happy to record before doing so just to prevent there being any problems down the track. And that's an ethical approach to journalism and podcasting and other media that we probably should adopt more broadly across the industry. I said earlier that podcasting is a form of audio storytelling. That being the case, you should approach either whole episodes or individual segments like you might creating any other story. Figure out what the beginning, middle and end are. What is the point of this story? Who are you talking to and what do you want to say to them? These are all important questions when thinking about how to craft your podcast or, as I said, any other media. But this episode isn't all about me. I brought in my colleague Michelle O'Connor, lecturer in communication here at Charles Sturt University for a chat. Michelle is a lifelong audio creator for radio and broadcast and podcasts as well. And she's working on a PhD in the field. So, Michelle, I invited you to have a bit of a chat with me about how we go about composing segments and thinking about some of the different elements of a segment in producing podcasts or pieces for podcasting. What are your tips? (laughs) (laughs) Thanks. Thanks, Travis. Thanks for inviting me on. Well, where do I start? Okay. Tips for putting a podcast together. I guess there's some... um, you know, fundament, you know, the commentators talk about this notion of um, grabbing the listener in the first, you know, some say seven seconds, mm. um, and that you have to in some way make sure that you've got the listener's attention and that in that beginning sequence mm-hmm. so that they want to keep listening. And, you know, there's people who follow... Um, podcasts and they look at stats and stuff they look at that first that first seven to ten seconds of drop off I reckon you could probably extend that a little bit longer and and if you think about your own listening practices right how long would you listen to a podcast before you go oh, that's not what I want to listen to today so thinking about how you can grab the listener in the opening sequence now what that that depends on you right that's your creative mm. decision. But if we think about podcasting as an intimate medium, so, you know, similar to radio, radio is called an intimate medium and podcasting is an intimate medium. If we think about that practicality of people listening to a podcast with headphones on or earbuds, and so there's a connection straight to the ear of the listener. There's nothing in between. You have a priority seat to the listener. And whether you capture them in the opening sequence through talking to them Mm -hmm. um, or creating an interesting montage of sounds that might capture their attention um, or, or, you know, some interesting voices, maybe a a vox pop at the beginning uh, of interesting voices, something that... um, Perhaps the listener's going to go, ah, oh, right, what's this about? I, I want to know what that's about. So that's, I guess, in terms of structuring sounds mm-hmm. at the beginning of the podcast. Um, so different, you know, different podcasters take a different approach, right? And, and it may be that it's the way that you talk to the listener, right, in that conversational tone where you're almost whispering, right? You're, you're talking directly into the ear of the listener. So think about how you're going, what the first 10, 20, 30 seconds is going to sound like yeah. and make that a conscious decision, I reckon. Yeah, so you, rather than just something you go into and kind of just record whatever feels right at the moment, you've actually got to think that, that bit through yeah. and be um, intentional 
about it. Absolutely. Tell me about some of your practice. I know you go about creating soundscapes in all sorts of interesting locations and with a sense of trying to capture a sense of place in audio. How do you do that? I think actuality works really well in podcasts and I guess the type of podcast that I'm talking about here is more like a radio documentary. Um, There's not necessarily just the chat cast or, you know, where two people are chatting like you and I are here, but maybe maybe, um, more around that radio documentary genre. Um, And so actuality, I think actuality works really well in sound because... Um, sound is so evocative and we talk about, we often talk about radio as being theatre of the mind, you know, that through sound you're able to evoke the imagination of the listener. And so we would do that through actuality, that is being on location and recording. Um, And that's getting sounds of atmospheres or sounds of the environment that may be relevant to a part of the story that you're telling in, in your podcast. Doing that is, a, I think, a process of practice, right? And it's practicing with microphones. It's practicing with the right microphone. Um, I think once you start recording on location, you get a very quickly get a real sense of external noises or the amount of sound in our environment. So if you're trying to capture a particular sound or maybe it's um, a street sound, you know, there's maybe there's a, a festival on or something in, in the street and you're trying to capture that. Um, maybe you're trying to capture something really particular, the sound of a, a creek bed or the, the river running through where you live. You'll invariably hear in the background traffic, right? Yep. And so... Uh, microphones pick up everything. So it's about a process of trial and error and practice and um, experimenting with different microphones and and different locations Um, early in the morning, you know, getting up early and capturing sounds early. I try and um, film, uh, I film, I try to record the sound of birds. That's what I really love um, capturing. Where I live, I can't get a, a clean feed, right, because there's just – I live on the highway and there's always cars going past. Um, Microphones, you know, use the best microphone that you can, um, but also – The traffic sounds, right? The traffic, you've got them there. Yeah. They're in everything, right? And that's part of our natural – that's a part of our lived environment is is traffic. Um, but you know, and and does what you capture sound like what you what mm-hmm. it's meant to sound like? Um, and I often use the example of um, we have the Womble, the Macquarie River here in Bathurst, and I I've recorded from there. And sometimes when I listen to it, I think it just sounds like you know the toilet flushing, right? Mm-hmm. So it's just you know what what does the sound sound like what you want it to, and but and can you recreate it right? Maybe you need to recreate the sounds. Yeah, and so uh, one technique that podcasters um, will often use is they'll spend time in a space recording, um, and even if the interview takes place in that same location, in order that the editing doesn't sound too um, unnatural, you'll underlay the track from the same location um, under the conversation, and that sort of elides, uh, it hides any edits or cuts that you might make, right? So that's one really specific tip. When you are recording, sometimes you need these multi-tracks in order to make it sound natural, yeah. even though that edit, uh, even though that isn't natural, it's not uh, an in-situ beginning to end capturing of the sound. You can so use music, you can use a music bed to do the same mm-hmm. thing. So music sort of helps to evoke a mood, Um and you can choose, you know, you can put a music bed that kind of um, evokes a mood to, um, that matches what you're talking about in your podcast. And you can also use it functionally, a music bed functionally in the same way, right, to yep. kind of mask those edits or cuts. Yeah, absolutely. 
thinking about the notion of intimacy in podcasting, so we talk about the fact that often people are listening through headphones or earbuds and so it's, there's a physical connection to the body, which is quite different to a lot of, uh, a lot of other media. Um, and it makes podcasting and audio immersive in a way that television isn't. You know, the screen is separate from, from the body. Um, it might be more close more closely related to something like VR, for example, um, nowadays. How can you generate a sense of intimacy to, to build on what's already inherent within the medium in connecting with somebody? Um, you know, I guess the, the tradition has been developed over the past 100-plus years of radio and, and um, the radio industry that lends itself to podcasting as well. Um, functionally, I reckon you talk to the listener. Mm-hmm. You, don't, you don't give a speech. You're not giving a speech. You're not on a stage. Um, you, you're, you are actually talking to the listener. And that mm, I actually, you know, try to envisage who that listener might who are we be. Who talking to? Yeah, yeah, who are you talking to? And... It, you know, you're talking to someone you feel comfortable talking to. Yep. That's your best friend. It could be your mum. It could be your dad. It could be whoever you feel really comfortable t- talking to. You're talking to that person. Um, and in your scripting, you use uh, a conversational approach in your scripting as well. So use contractions if that's, you know, that's the way you speak. Um so script as you speak, mm-hmm. write as you speak. Um, and functionally, we talk about this, um, this notion of um, talking into the mic, right? And so positioning the way that you talk yeah. into the mic. I'm going to come really close to the mic now. Well, I, I was going to say... Because you're really far away from yeah. it. Yeah. What's been happening there is as Michelle's been talking about this, she's getting closer to the microphone. Now, I'm sure you can hear that's that. That's my training. But, but that's the actual um, – to describe what's actually happening and go along with the listening is important to think about. Yeah. yeah. My training is, you know, to talk closely into mm-hmm. the microphone because that helps to achieve that sense of intimacy as well. But yeah. there, there's nothing between my voice and the listener's ear. And I think here I am sitting back. If you're sitting back, I think there's a whole lot of more space. It's a space. completely different tone. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the other thing, which just before we started recording, we talked about, and um, I could certainly hear it in the headphones when it started up, but I turned off the air conditioning in this room. However, it's sensor operated. And so the fact that we're sitting under the air conditioner, it's turned back on uh, a couple of minutes into the recording. And so people might have heard that, right? And the, the, the quality of the air in the room has changed as, as a result of that. So so think about where you're recording and um, think about the acoustics of the space in which you're recording. And during COVID, podcast makers were recording in their closets, right? Uh-huh. Or, or in the wardrobe. Um, somewhere where there's a whole lot of soft furnishings around you. Um, you know, Ira Glass, who's the, who presents This American Life, and he's often cited as one of the presenters who really transformed the podcasting genre or the way that we present in podcasting. There's photos of him. You can go and check them out. You know, he's, he's in his wardrobe mm-hmm. with his recorder and set up and recording in there. Practically. The, the technical reason for that that people might not understand is that the way that sound waves propagate through space um, and they reflect off walls. Yeah. So they reflect off hard walls. Yeah. And if you're in a space with soft furnishings and soft fabrics, uh, that will absorb the sound so that it doesn't bounce back and come into the microphone multiple times. Yeah. Um, don't record in the bathroom. Mm-hmm. Um, if you are recording, I think, um, you know, in the bedroom is fine. Close the curtains even, just close the curtains to minimise the window um, or in the car. So actually if you think about the car, it's kind of got its own natural acoustic space, you know, it features anyway. Um, And so recording in a car is actually okay as well, I reckon. really interesting. Yeah. 
Um, I, I would never have thought of a car as a recording studio, but there we have it. Oh, well, I learned that from a long-term um, colleague of ours, Tracy Sorensen, mm-hmm. who's a filmmaker, and um, that's her guerrilla filmmaking tip, is to record yeah. your audio um, and voice, voice, you know, um, piece to cameras in a car. Yeah. I want to think about segments, so... Um, What we'll hear in this podcast sequence over the next few weeks, this is uh, going to be episode six in the series, and there will be an additional five episodes which feature student voices. Now, the students will be contributing to specific segments. They'll be um, just recording small segments of the podcast on the theme, and we'll stitch all of those together. It can be a bit difficult. And perhaps some of my role as the podcast producer here is going to be composing and figuring out this order, but we're also going to do that collaboratively. But if you're recording segments independently and you don't know how they're going to come together, um, aside from the fact that they're going to be related to a theme, how could you think about approaching a segment? What What is going to be different there when you're not composing the whole show? but just one segment. The listener. Mm-hmm. The listener. It's always about the listener, I, I reckon, right? What What is going to be interesting about this segment to the listener? And the putting together of those segments, and, and different podcasts do it in, in different ways. This American Life again, they use the chapter. Mm-hmm. So Ira Glass, you know, chapter one, and that's the first chapter of the podcast chapter two and so there is a theme in that podcast as well and they they kind of they're really clearly identified as being different chapters there's the segue so the in your scripting you would write the segue right and so you would record the the narration the voiceover narration of of the segue well i'm going to have students do that hopefully so that's the the plan is that you'll hear student voices doing those bits the intros the outros the segues uh all of that So the segue, you do need to know what's in the podcast, what's in that segment to be able to write the segue. Um, And so you'll find, you know, what was, what did you finish off? What what did the listener hear at the end of that segment? What can you say about it to kind of contextualise it in your segue narration? And then how are you going to um, uh, introduce the next segment, right? So... The segue is the is the contextualising. But I think it's about the listener. What is it, as you're producing your segments, what is it that's going to be really interesting to the listener for this? Yeah. Fantastic. Michelle, is there any other hot tips we need to mm. give to people considering how to compose podcasts? Lots, but we... There's, there's just not enough time. We don't need to talk for hours. There's lots. Um, Might be one thing to think about what what's important to include. <laughs> okay, I think I've covered them. I'll just so I'll just go over them again. Mm. I think you've got to talk to the listener um, in your scripting, but also in the physical way that you set up your recording equipment. And if that that's just using if that's using a, an iPhone, right? talk into the microphone, right? Make sure that you actually talk into the microphone yeah. and, and I think be quite close to the microphone. Th- that's actually really important when you're thinking about um, the difference between, you know, we are recording here with Rode pod mics mm. and so, yeah, I'm sitting 30, 40 centimetres back from the mic. You're moving in and out uh, at different moments. The That's kind of okay for a mic of this quality and we can still get different effects while moving in and out but... If you're recording with a lower quality mic, then actually proximity is really important. Yeah. And so being quite close, I think talk to the listener. Think about the listener. What would be really interesting in this piece of content? Um, Make it interesting to listen to as well and really um, absorb that notion of theatre of the mind. And so theatre of the mind is that notion that through listening that you're able to make up the pictures, right? Mm -hmm. From what you hear, what you're listening to, in your mind you kind of make up the pictures of, of that scene or what's going on there. In some way you're evoking the, the, the imagination of the listener. 
it can even be useful sometimes to describe the space that yeah. you're in if it's an unusual space in particular. So yeah. you can say, you know, I'm here at um, a particular type of shop or I'm here with such and such who is and this is their office or whatever it happens to be, if it, if it helps to invoke that mental image. Yeah, and that's a, that's, um, you know, that's a technique used in industry and you, can, you hear that all the time. You know, you'll hear journalists reporting from... Um, and they give a great description of the scene that they're re- yeah. where they are, where they're reporting from, um, and so yes, you can do that and go and try that. Right, I reckon go and I would give you this activity. Go and try that. Go go to a, a, a place um, and uh, a location and describe it into your phone. Record it into your phone and describe it, and then play it back to yourself and or, or to a friend and see if they can kind of get the sense of where you were from from your description. Um, I think that's a great kind of activity to help you practice um, reporting from location but also talking to someone as well. Yeah, because you've got to remember your... Well, you're talking to the listener, you're talking to them from somewhere. Yeah. Um, and so there's that connection across time and space that you need to account for. Yes, look, in the early days, here we go, in the early <laughs> days of radio, um, you know, in the in the 20s and the 30s when radio was, as a technology, was still being experimented with and before it was, um, um, uh, you know, uh, had some guidelines attached to it that made it become an industry... There, there was this sense, you know, people thought that it was um, almost ghost-like, that, mm-hmm. that hearing voices that we couldn't see where they were coming from, that it was almost, um, you know, people thought it was the dead talking to them, you know, that disembodied, that notion of the disembodied voice. Um, and so, you know, it was a, akin to a seance almost, that where were these voices coming from? And and at the time, people, the, you know, the general public, there was – some people were afraid of it, right, because they were like – they could not understand this notion of hearing voices but not seeing where they, yeah. they come from. Um, anyway, that's a little bit of – Radio history. Another bit of radio history and trivia then, there's also a sort of political aspect to this sometimes. So um, one of the most famous sort of taglines, I think, in, in radio is this is the BBC from London and you get that you get that kind of tone at the start of there. And uh, that, that in its own way was a real empire-building um, project to say London is the centre of the British Empire and this is where we're coming to you from. BBC from London um, in a kind of grand way, emphasising that political power. Yes. Radio has been used, well, uh, uh, arguably radio has been used for soft power, but it's also been used for propaganda mm. as well. And, um, um, yeah, it's it still reaches the masses and um, it's the technology that still reaches the masses um, where, you know, I know that you're talking about digital technologies and media in this subject but you know not not the whole world doesn't have access to the internet and but that you know radio is relatively cheap and it's a um, a relatively yeah. um, easy way for communities to connect that's See, what it's about connection that's that's what it's about this sound is about connecting yeah and so even when we're producing podcasts which are delivered in a different way um, and across a different medium, it still adopts some of those trappings of radio. It still embraces the, the audio traditions there, which is important to think about. Thanks so much. Thank you, Travis. It's been a pleasure. Above all, podcasting, like other media, should be open to experimentation, to iteration and to fun. Take a listen to your recordings after they're completed with a critical ear and be prepared to try something new if needed. Feel free to edit, to experiment, and as I said, as much as possible, have fun. Thanks to Michelle O'Connor for being part of this episode. Thanks to everyone who I've been able to interview so far in this series. As I said, in future episodes, we're looking forward to getting some student voices on the feeds, and I can't wait. 
This has been Digital Society with Dr. Travis Holland for Charles State University. Thanks for listening.